gospel reading today is from the, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. He, that is Jesus, was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, don't bother me, the door's already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a, a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Amen. Some of you may have noticed that we didn't say the Lord's Prayer today in the spot where we normally say it. And that's because we're doing this sermon series on living, learning to live as disciples. And today's theme is praying, and particularly praying in the way that Jesus taught us in the prayer that we now call the Lord's Prayer. You know, saying it every week the way we do makes it kind of a rote thing. It's, it's something that we don't have to think about. We know it, and we can just say it, and we could be writing grocery lists in our head as we do it. So... It's good from time to time to stop and remember what it is that we're actually saying. It's a prayer that starts off in a warm, fuzzy, cozy, intimate kind of way and ends up with a huge challenge towards the end. It actually takes some courage, I think, to pray this prayer when we really actually think about what we're saying. So we're going to wait until after the sermon's over and see if we're ready still to pray it then. This prayer appears in two places in the Bible. It's in Matthew's Gospel and also in Luke's Gospel. But Matthew's version of it is longer and closer to the one that we use. You may have noticed in the reading, Luke's Gospel, it's pretty short. Neither one of them ends it the way we do, although that doxology, as it's called, that we put on in the end is in Matthew's Gospel, just not as part of the prayer. So the disciples had asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And we're going to go line by line through what he said. So the first thing he said is Father. And actually, the way that word is translated, it's closer to Daddy. Even though we say Father, it's an intimate word. It's a word of a relationship with there is a lot of intimacy to that relationship. It's it's the kind of word that makes you feel safe, if, if daddy is a good word for you. In those days, it was thought that the name summed up the whole character of the person. So if you knew someone's name and used it, you were actually talking about their character. So when Jesus used the word Abba, which is kind of like our daddy, he was saying a great deal about the character of God. 
Not everyone is comfortable, though, with this word father, and there's a number of reasons for that. Not everybody's had a loving, warm, snuggly daddy for a father. And so for some people, that word brings up hard memories, things that are uncomfortable, things that they don't really want to associate with God. And I think another problem for a lot of us is that the word implies that God is a man. And actually, there are lots and lots of references in the Bible to God acting like or being like a woman. But we have to remember it was written in patriarchal times, and sometimes those words got sort of written out or made to feel less important. There are all kinds of images that talk about God creating humanity by nurturing us in a womb. In Isaiah, the prophet who is speaking for God says, Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. There are images of God crying out like a woman in labor with gasps and pants. In the book of Numbers, Moses tells God that having birthed Israel, God should carry the nation in God's bosom as a nurse carries a suckling child. In Isaiah, the Lord tells Jerusalem, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. And Jesus, who at one point says he and the Father are one, describes himself weeping over Jerusalem and saying, How often I have desired to gather your children together as a mother hen gathers her brood under her wings. So we're not really to think of God as that old white man with the long beard up in heaven. We have many, many images of a God who created all of us. And in fact, the Bible says God created us in God's own image, male and female, and is the God of all races and nations. So it's, it's hard to put a picture on our God, but if we were to put it, we would have to have a lot of pictures because God created all of us in God's own image. But here, Jesus uses the word father, and again, we might think of that word actually as the word daddy. The next line is, hallowed be your name. Before we ask for something for ourselves or even for other people, Jesus reminds us that this one to whom we speak, even though this is a really intimate, familial relationship, we are speaking to God, and we need to come with a, a proper sense of reverence for uh, this person, this being, is worthy of our greatest respect. The next line, your kingdom come. Well, in some ways, that had already happened when Jesus started to teach this prayer because Jesus was the visible sign of God's kingdom breaking into our life on earth. But it's supposed to continue. We aren't there all the way yet. We aren't full of that love and that peace, the justice and mercy that are signs of God's kingdom. And so we pray that that kingdom is still going to come, and it's going to be right here, right now, in this time and place, not in some far off, far away place that we don't yet really fully understand. But this is where the prayer starts to get a little bit tricky, because as we pray that that kingdom will come, we have to kind of search our hearts and say, are we ready to participate in it? Are we doing all the things we need to do as children of God to live out that kingdom? And where there are ways that we wander off that path, we need to take a look at how we're going to get back on if that kingdom is going to be fully here. So this part of the prayer starts to ask something from us as well as something from God. The next line, give us each day our daily bread. Well, when the people were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and they prayed for God to take care of them, one of the responses when they said they were hungry was God gave them manna for heaven, this bread-like substance that appeared every day. They were told to collect enough to eat for just one day, except for when the Sabbath came, when they could collect enough for two days so that they didn't have to work on the Sabbath. 
But God specifically said you can't store it up. You can't save it for later. You have to count on me each and every day. Well, this sort of flies in the face of way, the way our culture teaches us to prepare for retirement, doesn't it? We, we do want to store it up so that we can say we have enough for all those years that we hopefully get to enjoy it. But this begs a question. What does it mean to depend on God each and every single day? And what does that look like in our lives now? But here comes the really hard part. This is the part that makes me sometimes say, ooh, I don't know if I should pray this prayer today. The line goes, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Do we? <laughs> That's a tall order. We forgive everyone who's done anything that bothered us, right? We, we are going to forgive them all. We just do it. Well, this part of the prayer assumes that all of us sin. And again, I think sometimes we have a problem in modern days with that word. When we just had vacation Bible school, I sometimes think everybody that writes vacation Bible school curriculum lives deep in the Bible belt because it's always pretty intense about the word sin. And somehow that word is hard for a lot of us because we think it's, it's harsh, it's judgmental. But I said to the kids, and I know I've said it before in here, the word sin actually comes from the game of archery. When you are shooting the bow, or the arrow, and you are trying to hit that mark in the bullseye, if you miss the mark, it's a sin. That's what a sin is. It's missing the mark. And when you think of it that way, even the best archers in the whole world miss the mark sometimes. And it means they have to go back and practice some more. Try again. Get, get better at hitting that mark. And that's true for all of us, isn't it? None of us hit the mark that Jesus set all the time because the mark is high. It's hard to hit it on a regular basis, always, always, always. So to sin means we've missed the mark and we do it all the time. But it means we need to practice more. Not that we need to beat ourselves up, but we need to practice more at hitting that mark. So the problem is here, we can say, all right, well, we've sinned, maybe, we missed that mark. But then it says we forgive everybody who's done something to miss the mark with us, somebody that's hurt us. And that's the hard part. And in fact, when we pray it, the way we pray it in here, it's even a little bit harder. Because we say it, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass us. And when you think about it, that means we're asking God, forgive us, you forgive us, God, the same way that we forgive the people who have hurt us in some way. When you think about it, would you want God to treat you the way we sometimes treat the people that have hurt us? How well, it begs us to ask, are we doing at forgiving each other? Do not bring us to the time of trial. Well, this one is an interesting one because for the people who were hearing this prayer, the time of trial was real. Jesus was about to be crucified. There were people that were saying, we have to snuff out this little upstart church that seems to be growing around our faith. And so the time of trial could be hideous, horrible, very difficult situations. And, and the prayer says, don't bring us to that place where we might lose our faith. That place where we'll buckle because we just can't do it anymore. In simpler ways, we bring ourselves to times of trial all the time. As we go through life and we hit obstacles, we all question sometimes. We all wonder, you know, what is this all about? I would guess there are moments where each and every one of us have said, I don't get it. And we've lost that faith for a while. But the prayer is for God to help us out with that, for God not to bring us to that time of trial. And we know we are going to get there sometimes, but those times are the opportunities to deepen our faith. I think a lot of us would say that our faith got stronger when we went through times of trials. 
The trick is it's got to be strong enough when you get there to hold up. I know so many people who went to seminary and they had learned platitudes throughout their lives. And those platitudes were meant to make people feel better when life got hard. But when life got really hard, sometimes those platitudes weren't enough. They didn't hold up. So developing a strong enough faith, a faith that will get you through times of trials, means to ask questions. Some faiths tell you, don't ask questions. We'll, we'll just tell you from up here what to think. But that's not the way Methodists are. John Wesley blessed us by saying, one of the pillars of our kind of faith is to use your reason to think about things, to ask the questions, to dig deep so that you can come to some coherent understanding as you read scripture with all of the years of tradition behind it, that you can come to some understanding that will take you through those difficult times so that it never gets to be such a trial that you lose your faith. So Jesus sort of brings us back now to the beginning. He started by saying we have this intimate, loving daddy that we're praying to. And then we wandered through this area where you have to pray that that daddy's going to forgive you the way you are forgiving everybody else. Now he comes back to this time of intimacy. He tells a story, as he often did, that um, about a, a person who's in their house and a friend comes, maybe unexpectedly, it sounds like unexpectedly, and kind of late at night, the friend arrives and there is nothing the host has to give them to eat. Well, this is really serious in those days because hospitality was huge. People traveling through the desert could, could get in real trouble. They could run out of water, run out of food, and it was life-threatening. So you were supposed to welcome people into your home and take good care of them. So this person says, gosh, I don't have any food to feed my friend. I'll go to my neighbor, who's also my friend, and ask him for some food. Now Jesus says, imagine this happening. He says, imagine the friend doesn't want to get up out of bed and says, go away. I've already gone to bed. <laughs> I'm not going to give you any food. And Jesus says it is because the person persists in act asking that finally that guy's going to get up out of bed and give him some food. And a lot of times when we read this, we go, really? Is that what God is like? We have to wear God down by asking and asking and asking. And it's not the greatest image of God. But William Barclay says, no, we're missing the point. Barclay says, Jesus doesn't say God is like this. Jesus is holding up an example of what God is not. And in those days, people would not expect even your neighbor to say, no, I won't get out of bed and give you any bread. Hospitality was that important. So Jesus is saying, God is not like this. He goes on to give more examples. He said, parents, you know, if your children ask for something nice, are you going to give them something awful? Of course not. It's the same thing with this story. Are you going to say, I won't get out of bed to help my friend? No, you'll get out of bed to help your friend. And God, who is way more generous than you, will certainly answer your requests. It doesn't mean that we don't persist in prayer. Jesus does go on to say that we are to knock, to ask, to seek, and that the door will be opened and we will find the answers and we will find the things we need. But Jesus is not saying you have to batter God down. Jesus is saying God is far more generous than any of you are. If you would give bread to your neighbor, think what God will give to you. And so we are invited to keep asking, to keep knocking, to keep searching, because God, like a good parent, is longing to have a conversation with us about what we want and about what we need. And God is ready to provide those things we need. Maybe not always what we want. God is not that kind of God. And that's not good parenting either, right? To give a child everything they think they want. But to provide what the child needs, that's our job.
So Jesus says the gift of the Holy Spirit is what will be provided to us, and that is the very best gift of all. So today we're going to go ahead and pray that prayer that we pray every week. We're going to pray it the way it's been interpreted down through the ages and the way that we always pray it here. But today let's be particularly mindful of what that prayer is asking of us as well as what it's asking of God. And be mindful of the comfort and the challenge that's inherent in that prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.